Uh, our second uh, speaker, it's my honor to present Professor uh, Tari Elbaz. Professor uh, Tari Elbaz, as we know, that was in chairman and president of ESNT. He is currently the president of Arab Society of Nephrology. He is a professor of uh, nephrology uh, on Al Azhar University. Uh, we are sure that we have uh, a very illuminating uh, talk this uh, day, morning, and uh, I understand that he has a, a very interesting uh, field of uh, microbial intervention in hemodialysis. Does it do anything good? I think yes, the uh, answer. And let us hear from one of the pioneers in this field, Professor Tarek Bez. Please go. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, uh, dear chairpersons and uh, audience. Uh, I, I wish so much to be with everybody, wish you all the luck. Uh, I want to extend my thanks to Professor Naga and his wonderful team, uh, <clears throat> Imani Gohari and Mohammed Saeed, and also I take the opportunity to con congratulate uh, my good friend uh, Hala for her new appointment, wishing her all the luck. Uh, right, I'm, I'm going to address the microbiome interventions in hemodialysis, maybe this is new to most of you. And uh, I will start by talking about logic. And when I'm referring to logic, I don't mean what Aristotle so many centuries uh, ago uh, founded, but rather the modern logic that was founded by many philosophers in the early uh, 19th century and extended to the 20th century. Logic we are using every day, it is the way facts or events follow or relate to each other. Well, this is this is good. In medicine, it's a little bit different because it is regarded as the sum of the total education and experience one gains that is integrated in our minds, making us able to uh, take a medical decision. And this is how we make medical decisions. But is logic always right? Logic is quite different in mathematics and computer sciences than in real life and definitely in medicine. I will give you an example about logic in medicine. We all know that statins are very good for health. Uh, they are protecting against heart attacks and strokes and so forth and has been documented in all guidelines. When we take this statement to patients with chronic kidney disease, we find that, that chronic kidney disease patients substantially have a greater risk of cardiovascular disease due to uh, hypertriglyceridemia and various uh, other factors as well. And there is benefits from various studies that using statins is good in protection up to stage four. But unfortunately, there doesn't appear to be a benefit to treat people with statins, even it could be dangerous once they reach end stage. The variables are so much, even outweigh the hyper. Uh, triglyceridemia, and patients are more prone and susceptible to complications of statins. So here you can see that the logic is giving us a, a negative uh, result. If you're going to follow the previous statements, uh, you get the patient into trouble. Now, Moving on to the gut microbiota and disease, it's well understood now that the gut this biosis is so much involved in various disease areas, and I'm going to expand this slide a little bit. I'll try to expand it to show you some uh, details here. Okay. Once there is breaching of the intact barrier of the colon, a lot of toxins such as trimethylamine oxide and indoxide sulfate and pigrosol pass into the circulation and this is how trouble starts to occur. You can see here it is related to a chronic inflammatory state that may uh, affect the progression of chronic kidney disease and is related to various other disease uh, uh, areas elsewhere, you can see there is an increased mortality plotted against the dysbiosis as well. So this dysbiosis and alteration of the gut microbiota is now evidence-based in relation to uh, these uh, various uh, conditions. 
Looking at this diagram, you can see that this biosis of the gut microbiota has a central role where uh, endotoxins are released. And once the endotoxins are released, there is a state of inflammation that may lead to insulin resistance and the appearance of diabetes, cardiovascular uh, diseases, and chronic kidney disease. Also, it has been related, this biosis, to another areas such as obesity, inflammatory bowel disorders, and even sleep disorders, not to mention depression as well. This biosis of the gut has another impact on the immune system, causing its dysregulation, which would enhance also infection, and infection definitely will lead to a chronic state of inflammation with a resultant morbidities on the various systems that I have been to. This Sky blue background so shows you the physiological aspects of the colon in a physiological symbiotic gut microbiome. Everything is good, the commensins are abundant, the barrier is integral, and a steady state of uh, low, I, I can't say a low grade inflammation, but rather there is no inflammation, and this is happening due to this peptide called the pattern recognition receptor as well as this ancient uh, antimicrobial peptide that is responsible about repelling all uh, the pathobionts over here, not making them uh, breach or make holes and pass through uh, the barrier. Not only this, but the B cells are active and producing immunoglobulin uh, A to fight any uh, possible pathobiont being. In CKD, what's happening? There is an increase in the stinal concentration of the uremic toxins, a very hostile media, as a matter of fact, killing most of the commensals and enhancing the growth of the pathobionts. We don't need the pathobionts in our colon, of course, and this leads to loss of the barrier integrity and breaching of the epithelium. Bacteria would pass, they would bind through the lipopolysaccharide to the receptor complex on the macrophages, the dysregulated immune response I just mentioned is happening. There's a production of a lot of pro-inflammatory pro cytokines leading to a state of inflammation. All of this has been documented to lead to progression of chronic kidney disease and the development of cardiovascular diseases. Now, the, the scene is different, is on fire. As you can see, there is dysbiosis, intestinal urea and ammonia are abundant. The media is very hostile and acidic. The pathobionts are, are, are abundant. They have breached uh, the barrier and the state of inflammation is happening. And this is how disease happens when the endotoxins pass through this uh, intact barrier as well as the bacteria uh, themselves. The gut-drived uremic toxins, mainly the most important ones described are the indoxyl sulfate and peak resource sulfate, sometimes written as peak resile sulfate. They are very toxic uh, to the endothelium and they lead to a uh, vascular permeability. And this is, of course, very serious towards this very smooth lining of the blood vessels. High levels of endoxyl sulfate actually have been also described in states of vascular stiffness and aortic calcification that is quite common in our patients with other factors such as the excessive levels of FGF23 and the decrease in the amounts of vitamin K as well as the increase in the hyperparathyroid uh, thyroid hormone. All of these factors together have been associated with uh, the blood vessel calcification. So now today, these toxins, I want to stress, they are very important in this regard. And the gut-drived uremic toxins would contribute again to progression of chronic kidney disease and vasculopathies leading to cardiovascular morbidity up to mortality. You can see from this diagram how the endoxyl sulfate as a uremic toxin has a, a, a central role in the algorithm of cardiovascular diseases, it is related even to vascular access thrombosis, peripheral arterial disease, even arrhythmias have been linked to the endoxyl sulfate. It's a very serious uremic toxin. This is what's happening in chronic kidney disease. You are advising the patient 
to eat less fiber. Uh, mind you, now there is a new strategy, or let me say a shift, to, a paradigm shift in dietary management. You shouldn't be depriving the patient of potassium anymore, particularly in the early stages of chronic kidney disease. The patient and the body generally needs potassium. Maybe we can talk about this some other time. Decreasing the fiber in diet would lead to defective production of the short chain fatty acids that the body really needs and would result in a decrease in the amount of the commensals known as the sacrolytic microbiota. This would lead to alteration of the gut barrier once more and the pathobiomes can pass into the circulation and cause the disease. If a patient is eating excessive protein, we have a lot of protein in the gut, with increased porphyletic microbiota, again, nitrogenous waste are retained in the colon and breaching is going on and the toxins are passing through to the circulation. For years and years and maybe years to come, physicians will always be fighting aging, not because aging means wrinkles and loss of hair and teeth, but rather because aging means disease means Alzheimer, means cancer, means metabolic diseases, frailty, osteoporosis, and so forth. We are doing all we can to improve this aging process. How about chronic kidney disease? It's one of the diseases really where aging is enhanced. And particularly, I want to, through the slide, to uh, underline endothelial vascular aging known as EVA. This EVA uh, is happening due to endothelial senescence and a state of chronic inflammation. And you can see the state of chronic inflammation here. These are the things that are leading to it. The telomere attrition that can be treated by metformin, the low fat wind level described in chronic kidney disease, the oxidative stress, which is abundant in chronic kidney disease, and definitely the decreased growth. And today I want to add this biosis, microbiome dysbiosis is also sharing in endothelial chronic inflammation, as I have shown you in the previous slides, which would help in the occurrence of EVA. Microbiome metabolome in this study revealed that the excessive uremic toxins are produced as a result of the gut microbiota and namely the three endotoxins I have mentioned before. And this is just a publication to document this previous uh, uh, thing. And more and more publications are in this regard. Now, this is another interesting uh, publication related to intervention in chronic kidney disease and the possibility of giving the patient probiotics would help. Yes, uh, the authors of this trial published in the year 2018 found that giving the patients uh, probiotics improved dyslipidemia, glycemic profile, blood pressure, and various chronic kidney disease parameters through their anti-inflammatory and antioxidant effect when the gut uh, dysbiosis has been modulated. This is good. <clears throat> now, this is a systematic review, and I know we all respect so much systematic reviews. And the authors of this systematic review reviewed more than 831 uh, articles or publications, and, and they settled to just 11 of 20 studies valid for their assessment uh, to conclude that the gut microbiota in patients with chronic kidney disease uh, is a serious cause for uh, cardiovascular morbidity and that effects of intervention are beneficial. There is a decline in the sacrolytic bacteria in states of chronic kidney disease when there is dysbiosis and the fermenters are taking the upper hand, serving as a source of various uremic toxins that are insulting uh, the endothelium. Even the immune system, maybe I just mentioned that earlier, that the immune system is not immune at all to the uremic toxins and the accumulation of the urea and other wastes also are affecting the immune system, decreasing the number of bacteria that generate the short chain fatty acids. And the clinical studies, according to this uh, publication, uh, showed that there are benefits of dietary and probiotic interventions in slowing progression 
of the immune-related kidney disease. And this is, uh, this is rather a new uh, point uh, and published this year. This is how you would like to intervene through these uh, three modalities. I'm not going to discuss how to intervene today, but rather just showing you that you modulate the gut microbiota by giving prebiotics or probiotics, maybe by blocking the lipopolysaccharide or attenuating the inflammation, or giving adsorbents such as uh, activated charcoal, which would absorb some of the uremic toxins such as indoxal sulfate and peak resol present. Now, I'm here today to talk about the interventions in dialysis to show you if it's good or not. Is the logic of interventions in chronic kidney disease still valid and good? Does it do anything good in hemodialysis? Let me show you the data and you decide for yourself. This is a very sophisticated experiment that was published uh, this year, a few months ago, and uh, the authors divided their uh, cohort of patients into patients receiving the probiotics and others that were receiving uh, placebo. And as you can see here, 50 hemodialysis patients were randomized and they were maintained on probiotics for six months. Uh, the response to the interventions of the gut microbiota uh, was good. They assessed serum and fecal metabolome, a lot of sophisticated methodology as a matter of fact, serum albumin, endotoxin, endothelial activation markers, inflammatory markers, they measured a lot of things as a matter of fact, and they concluded that probiotics might modulate cyanide dysbiosis and consequently decrease the concentrations of certain uremic retention substances in the systemic circulation, and thus it would improve the outcomes of patients on hemodialysis. Of course, gut uh, uh, dysbiosis and intervening in, in, in this uh, aspect is a kind of therapy that is adjuvant to other things like controlling the blood pressure and blood sugar and so forth. Uh, but still, it is uh, rather effective. The methodology was sophisticated, uh, as I mentioned, in the primary endpoints of the study was the fecal microbiota profile, which showed that the commensal uh, level was rising. And here in the secondary endpoints, you see uh, the various inflammatory markers that have been assessed, a really sophisticated uh, trial with uh, very positive uh, results. Another uh, publication uh, or a systematic uh, review and meta-analysis concluded uh, that uh, these studies show benefits of probiotic uh, given to patients on hemodialysis regarding the state of chronic inflammation and the levels of rheumic toxins. So this systematic uh, review concludes benefits of uh, intervening with the dysbiosis in patients on hemodialysis. And this is a very interesting uh, experiment published this year uh, the authors wanted to test the different mortalities of blood purification. We have Dr. Rajam Said with us today. And they concluded that maybe the hemodye filtration is offering uh, uh, slightly significant better results in, in, in the counts of uh, bacteria, the commensals, I mean, and have a better impact uh, on various parameters that they assessed. Of course, they documented the fact that intestinal microflora uh, uh, might be influenced by the uremia, and they concluded that different blood purification treatments do affect the endpoint, favoring uh, the hemofiltration. We need more of these uh, trials with bigger numbers in order to really uh, draw conclusions, yet it was uh, something new to think in this uh, track. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, increasing evidence has demonstrated that a bidirectional relationship does exist between the host, the gut microbiome, in patients with various kidney disease, not to mention in other disease areas. Intestinal inflammation and epithelial barrier breakdown do accelerate the systemic translocation of the bacterial drive uremic toxins such as the dupsal sulfate and the petrisol. And these are very serious toxins and the excessive amount of these toxins have been implicated in various processes of kidney disease development. 
and accumulating evidence does imply a role for probiotics in the treatment of chronic kidney disease patients as well as patients on hemodialysis. So back to my question, microbiome interventions in hemodialysis, does it do any good? It seems that the logic is good and positive, and the current data I have showed is just a snapshot of a lot of publications. Actually, the current data revealed that there is logic in this approach, and it could be a good adjuvant therapeutic modality for patients on hemodialysis. I thank you all for your kind attention. Thank you, Professor Tariq. As, as usual, very concise and very informative. You give us a lot of messages, a lot of messages. I like very much the inflame aging process that's happening in the uh, population of CKD. I would like yeah. also to, to, to uh, focus on the barrier of intestinal barrier, either intracellular or paracellular, and it is a vicious circle of inflammatory reactions that induce endotoxemia and subsequently tumor necrosis factor and more and more so it's a vicious circle. Uh, I would like also to thank you very much for peak crystal and doxyl sulfate which is coming from tryptophan and tyrosine which are, uh, can induce progress of CKD patients. So probiotic in stages of CKD population can halt or regress uh, that a lot. From our publication, which is published three or four years ago uh, in USA, we found that the hemodial filtration process improved the DNA methylation, and this could improve the patient whooping and retard the aging. But unfortunately, we didn't find that hemodial filtration can improve the bicrystal sulfate because it's 95% albumin. Uh, uh, pounded. So we need uh, uh, more and more uh, therapeutic challenge beside dialysis to improve the outcome and improve the well-being. Thank you very, very much. Very informing, uh, illuminating a lot of text, and thank you again. Thank you, Professor Shem. Thank you very much.